so first of all, welcome. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, job one, please find a seat. There, there are some about, or uh, find a comfortable spot. We're going to be here for six hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's just my talk. Yeah. Um, so thank you very, very much indeed for coming along. Um, we want to try and keep this really informal and uh, just having some place for people to mix, people to have a chat, people to talk, people to uh, get to know other people. But before we kick off, I, I thought I'd give, give you just a, a couple of minutes uh, a flavour of what this event is supposed to be, why, why it is what it is, why it's where it is. So, uh, myself, Ken Field, for those of, those of you who don't know me, hello. Uh, Chris Wesson and Ben Flanagan. So the three of us with the extremely exclusive t-shirts, $24.99 afterwards. Um, so we've been friends and colleagues for a number of years, and we've been around a lot of the different conference circuits and a lot of the different events, and we kind of got to feeling that we see a lot of the same people at the same events, and um, how, can we, how can we make an event that perhaps changes things a little bit? But more than that, it's like, what, what about an event or a conference is it that people like? And frankly, it comes down to the end of the day when you're a little bit tired, but you go to the bar and you have a beer and you get talking to somebody new who perhaps you've not met before, or somebody who gave a talk early in the day that you want to just chat to. And then those conversations become friendships and uh, they, they lead to different um, um, sort of relationships. So we thought, right, let's take the best bits of that then. Why don't we try to create an event series that's a little bit different. Um, let's try to host it in a pub. Um, let's perhaps uh, invite one or two people to part with some cash to allow us to have some free beer. And uh, wine and soft drinks and coffee and anything else you prefer. And, um, and just have a, a relaxed evening together in, a, in, a, in an environment that uh, hopefully creates a comfortable space. So, why Longitude? Um, I stole that from a conference I went to last year. Um, and the idea is it's a convergence. And so we didn't want to necessarily create a, an, an event for people who identified as, as mappers, as cartographers, or people who identified as geotech. We wanted an event, or anything else for that matter, but it's people who identify as wanting to communicate something visually. That might be through maps. It might be data visualisation, it might be data journalism, it might be art. It could be all sorts of different ways in which we um, work with visual information, the design community more generally. And quite often we found, certainly, um, people sit in silos at the traditional conferences and don't necessarily mingle so much. So that's the intent. Convergence is simply a, a convenient word where we all sort of come together and meet at a poll. The poll for tonight is uh, Brewdog Seven Dials. Thank you very much for having us here. Um, so a little bit about the format of the evening. Uh, we've invited four people who are going to talk for about an hour each. And that's just Ed. Uh, no, so maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to questions and just have a, a conversation after each uh, talk. And then we're going to have an open mic session. If anybody wishes to come up here and just say something for a couple of minutes about what it is they do, um, what something they want to share, maybe a map they want to show or a, something that they've done. And then really it's just an opportunity to spend the rest of the evening or however long you wish to, um, to you know, meet somebody new, share something that you do with somebody that you've not uh, met before. Um, the plan for the evening then, um, at least the first part of the evening, uh, four excellent speakers, uh, well, three excellent speakers and one other. Um, so we plan to have um, four speakers, um, and in the interest of the event, uh, we're not going to give a great bio, we're not going to tell you where they're all from, it's just basically James, Alice, Ed and John are going to come up and talk about something. If they want to introduce themselves a little bit more about who they are and where they're from and what they do, that's entirely up to them. So that's enough by way of introduction. Uh, we're going to ask James if he's still here. He's still here. So, uh, this is James Cheshire, and uh, the first talk is, is his. Let me queue up. Right. 
Right, so um, the uh, title of my talk this evening is called uh, Be More Baboon, Less Unicorn. And it's a uh, phrase I used off the cuff, really, um, a few years ago when I was giving a talk at the Creative Mornings event. I don't know if any of you have been to Creative Mornings, but they're this, this is a great event series that are simply breakfast meets. Um, and they're similar to this in a way. They're a convergence of mainly designers and, and uh, people like that interested in um, particular themes that are given every week, um, or every month, sorry. So um, the theme of uh, this talk, and the reason why the baboon and the unicorn thing will come uh, to light, is really thinking about how uh, someone like me, who works a lot with data, and big data sets and computational uh, programming and that kind of stuff can team up with a designer uh, and to create some uh, maps and, and graphics. So um, the reason I <coughs> work with um, uh, Oliver Uberti, who's my collaborator and, and, and design partner, who he lives in the US, so it's a long way for him to come here. But we, we, we create books together. So a few years ago, we did one called London, the Information Capital, and then uh, about two or three years ago, we published uh, this one called Where the Animals Go. And I'm just going to talk to you about some of the creative processes uh, that go behind this particular book. Now, um, many of us uh, obviously like maps and enjoy cartography. And the nice thing about um, historic maps, in many ways, is that they've benefited from a strong cartographic tradition. So the people that create them have got backgrounds in cartography and design, or um, you know, there's certain rules they they follow, there's certain standards they aspire to, and increasingly, um, we've been thinking about this uh, unicorn uh, phrase, and I'm using it in a sense of uh, someone that can do absolutely everything. So we often uh, see in recruitment ads, and something we've been discussing a lot. If you look for an uh, information visualization designer or some other kind of job ad now, there's a big long list of things these people need. They need program experience, they need D3, they need web design, they need to be able to work with data. And actually, many of these job descriptions are sort of looking for unicorns. These are people that don't always have all these skills. And Oliver and I's uh, argument really is that's absolutely fine because actually, there are tremendous benefits in having a collaborative relationship between two people, each with their own set of skills, with some overlaps, but crucially they're having a creative conversation about how to produce, in this case, maps and graphics. And I think that's something that we're always keen to, to kind of push. There's some very strong reasons why you want a designer to do something or someone with a fine arts background and equally reasons why you'd want someone with data visualization uh, kind of in a programmatic sense through D3 or uh, programming um, in, in R or GIS software, which the things I do. So I've got two examples this evening uh, of the kind of work that we uh, do together and why I think we're a strong partnership. So this may be familiar to many of you, something that looks a bit like this if you work in geographic information systems. Uh, it is this big pile of points uh, that have been coloured in some particular way, and in this case we've got a coastline uh, on here. So this is uh, California, and the points that I'm showing you are GPS uh, locations of mountain lions in California. And, uh, Mountain lions in California are pretty famous uh, in that part of the world. Um, they are uh, very emblematic of the area, but also they have some serious challenges with uh, their dispersion uh, and their movements. Essentially, they're, they're penned in by these major freeways, and there's limits to essentially the genetic diversity they can attain because they can't breed with different groups um, in these different areas. And so we wanted to tell the story of these mountain Lions. And so we went, we spoke with the researchers who would give us a map that looks a bit like this. Okay, so as far as they're concerned, it gives them the information. You see that one line maybe goes down here and there's particular clusters, but it doesn't tell a huge amount of the story. What you need is context. Now, this again may look familiar to, to some of you. These are, I mean, the 
colors are, are terrible, but they're essentially the basis to a lot of the context that we need. There's rivers uh, on there, there's roads on there, there's the water, there's, there's the coastline and so on. And so we start with this and we go through a process of stripping back this information to tell the story. That's something that Oliver's taught me through his work, it was at National Geographic for a long time, that actually the story is the crucial thing that we're trying to put across. Actually fundamental to telling that story is getting your data right and working with uh, the data in order to strip it back to tell us a specific thing. So on top of uh, the context from roads and rivers and things like that, we were thinking about the terrain, because these mountain lines live in uh, more mountainous regions, and creating a, a base map of terrain that did not overpower the main story. And so we worked on a, I worked on a, a, a process here that created a stippling effect on the hill shade. So rather than show a standard elevation model like this, we actually have quite a subtle stippling that kind of mutes the, the terrain but gives you enough of the context. And so you can see here, this is the, the final version. So um, here we have the elevation data, here we have a, a standard hill shape data, and then if you combine those two uh, together a bit and do some magic by essentially drawing lots and lots and lots of little dots in the shadows, you can create a terrain map that preserves a lot of the detail without over, overpowering the, um, the, the main uh, story. So mute it back some more and add some urban areas. So these are the slight, these are the yellow points here. So again, we're showing the context, but we're not kind of overpowering the map. And this is something that I, I wouldn't have the confidence to do necessarily. All of us design that ground uh, is a real asset. And we can start adding the data, and we can start thinking about how these things would look on a page, what the layout's gonna look like. So of course we need to put text on, because it's a book. We need to start labeling some of these routes. And we need to start showing where uh, the, the mountain lions uh, are going. And you can see here how we've stripped back a lot of the data already. And in fact, what we're showing are a selection of routes, but also with uh, a few of the dots from these original data points. And we struggled a bit with trying to get this to kind of pop still in still the same way. So the, the data points here, um, we were keen to include because they kind of show a lot of work that the scientists have done. Um, and, but actually we took the decision that they're best left off and only focusing on these uh, five lions and actually enabling us to add a bit more detail about the particular parks and protected areas. And the nice thing about this approach is you can see immediately the stories that are emerging from this and the fact that there are these clusters of lions and maybe one here that, that does this uh, brilliant journey kind of, um, across some major freeways and so on. So it's having the confidence in the design, but also revisiting the data at every single step to ensure that you get to the point that you're aiming for. The second example, and there's lots of, lots of these, but the second one I'd, I'd like to uh, include and tell you about this evening is the use of metaphor to really help send a message home to people so that they know exactly what they're looking at without even having to read any of the uh, text or, or get into the graphic in a big way. So um, this is at the research paper of the scientists uh, we collaborated with. Uh, essentially there, there's a, a woods in uh, Oxford, just outside of Oxford, where every bird in that, living in that woodland has got an RFID tag attached to it. And there's all these sensors and you can see where the birds are going and they're blocking behavior on these particular feeders. So they know each individual bird, they know when it goes to a particular bird feed and it gets counted. And the research design here was to work out if the birds prefer going to feeders that were vacant, so with no other birds, or whether they were flocking and they preferred to visit the busier bird feeders. So they set up a grid of four bird feeders and, um, you know, diagrammatically here they're showing that these are the routes that maybe a bird would take. Now the data look like this. So each of these blocks of lines represents a bird feeder, and then you've got time going across the bottom of each here, and this is for one day, two days, and three days. 
and you can see that they're kind of like um, they're the different signatures. So every time there's a cluster of birds that go and visit the theatre, you get all the lines going up and down. And kind of squinting at this, you can see how a lot of those clusters of lines occur uh, about the same time around one feeder and then another feeder is more vacant. And so the story here really is that birds prefer to be in flocks when they're feeding. It doesn't matter if it's the same species, but they prefer the busier feeders. And so we wanted to show that story. Now the first thing we did was we said, well, these patterns are repeating themselves every single day. So actually, to tell that particular story, we don't need to show three days, we only need to show one day for that particular thing. So two days of data have gone, which makes our lives a lot easier. The second thing was, how do we make this look like something to do with birds and bird feeding and things like that? So I thought, well, why don't we convert these to points and we can start thinking about bird seed as our idea. And our discussions came through that you know, bird seed might be a nice idea. And so this is a, a set of uh, points, and this is one feeder, and the clusters of points are when, a, when birds are visiting that particular feeder here, sorry, four feeders here. And we've actually drawn lines that track between them. Now you're all looking at this saying, this is a lot less clear than the previous one. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you might be pushing it too far with the metaphor. But that's where the design magic comes in, because actually if you rotate these, you change the colour of the points and you compress them a bit, you can actually set them up so they look like bird feeders. So here's feeder one, feeder two, feeder three, feeder four. The clusters of points, we've got time of day here, the clusters of points are when the birds are visiting them. So you can see straight away that nothing's happening here, but there's a clear cluster there. And it then enables us to then draw some of those lines back on so that you can see the root of one particular <laughs> bird or one particular bird. So that's another example where I think we had the idea, Oliver in his head had a kind of clear endpoint, you know, we want these things to look like bird feeders, but I had to go back into the data and, and, and kind of mess around with it and think about how you do jitter plots and that kind of stuff to, to, to create the final um, so where the baboons come in, well, one of the studies we show is that baboons are very collaborative in their decision making. So uh, this is a study where uh, a troop of baboons, well it's about 80% of a troop of baboons, I said what happens to the other 20%, the researchers are like well we can't catch them, so 80% uh, is good to get. Um, uh, they, they, they plotted these baboons movements at second by second intervals over a period of weeks and they captured the moment where a decision was taken about what way to go. So whether they get the troopers left, right, straight, or whatever. And they found that it was very collaborative. It wasn't that it was an alpha female or an alpha male that was making the decision. It was kind of a consensus-based thing where the group went from one way to another. So the uh, more baboon, less unicorn is a, is a call really for ensuring that there's still space for collaboration between people with very specialist skill sets and not this move towards you know, unicorns who uh, seemingly can do everything but actually I don't think benefit from the collaborative right, engagement. Um, someone did say after said that well baboons throw shit at one another as well. Is that something that you need to worry about? And I'm willing to overlook that because uh, uh, I think it's quite a nice analogy. Thanks very much. We all throw shit at each other occasionally as well, I, I might know. Uh, so, uh, any questions for James immediately? Oh, <laughs> it's called one. Steve. Okay, I'm just going to ask you... I'll repeat it. Right. I'm going to ask you, um, you've enjoyed collaborating over several uh, different <coughs> projects. What's been the most surprising thing to you that you've learned from the other person's skill set? So for those at the back, uh, the question was, what's the most surprising thing that I've learned from Oliver's skill set in this case? I think the, um, the kind of the journey that I've been on, I think, is, is growing, in, I've, I've grown in confidence in uh, my ability to, to reduce the amount of data I'm trying to show on something. So from an academic background, you know, if you're 
in research or whatever, you know, the, the pressure is always on to show everything, make it look really complicated, and feel good about what you've done because it's a lot of data and it's really complicated and you know, haven't we all done well? Um, and actually, in reality, you, you start to interrogate these big hairballs of data and you can say, well, visually, so I, can't, I can't get anything out of these things, to be honest, um, as, a, as a lay reader or even someone else who hasn't been involved in the study. So um, the more we work together, the less I feel compelled to dump everything on the page. And we had a very similar conversation about another project last night where he was basically saying, why are we showing 10,000 of these things when one is serving the same purpose? You shout the question out. Um, are you a frustrated artist? <laughs> <laughs> okay, collaboration. But what other inspiration do you have? Or is it entirely through this collaborative? Uh, so the, the question was Am I a, a frustrated artist? And um, I guess, really, do I get the artistic energy from working with Oliver or not? Um, I mean, I. I'm so glad that computational GIS and cartography exists because I'm, if it was all done by hand, I'd, I'd not even got involved in it because I'm completely useless at, at that kind of side. Whereas Oliver actually has a fine art background, so his drawing skills and everything else are much better and he views a lot of the visualizations in, a, in an artistic sense. You know, the compositional element is something that I don't have anything of to be honest. I think that I'm very interested um, in, I guess, I'm interested in the storytelling aspect. So I think I enjoy asking critical questions about what is it people are actually going to get out of this thing if we, if we do it. And I think that's something that I enjoy. But actually, he and I, sounds a bit romantic really, but he and I go around <laughs> art galleries and stuff like that when we are together. Um, in California or, or wherever. It's one of the talks we did actually last um, at conference last year was in, uh, where we're talking, it's on, online, where we're talking, he's, he used this phrase, keep the well full, but basically this idea where, you know, like the stippling stuff, you know, that's an artistic technique and different colour palettes and things like that, we've been inspired to use based on particular things we've seen in museums and galleries. So. When do you stop? Because when, when, whenever you've got a data set which is being pressed you're trying to bring something like that. But, um, when do you know when you've reached that point where um, you've told the story, you've revealed what it is you want, and you can now move on to something else? When, when do you stop over engineering? Do you, do you know what that is? Uh, that's a good question. So the question is when, when do you stop? So when do you know when? It's finished. Um, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's, it's that's an interesting question. I, I think we just get us just get a sense. I mean, there's there's clearly practical logistical reasons why you got to stop. You know, because you know you run out of time. So I mean, that's a very helpful uh, deadline to, to make sure that you do it. But I think I don't know. It's just this. It sounds a bit silly, but it's just a bit of an intuition. Like I'm saying, last night we were on a call, and we probably spent two hours just like grinding through this particular data set, um, and it was um, some sort of historic data we were looking at. And you know, the, you just we just kept grinding away, and I was like, oh, just you know, let's give up and try again tomorrow. We, we push through it. I think that that's the crucial bit. I think that having a, a clear initial plan about where you want to get to, and then kind of be very critical and interrogated at that point. And then when you get to that point with the work, you can then maybe iterate back around. I mean, one one of the challenges with this book was working alongside lots of researchers who would tell you the story that they know, they're like, the data show this, full stop. We'd then go away and visualise it, and then they go, oh, actually, well, look at that, I didn't see that before, that's really interesting, that's a bigger, so you then have to move back round and, and, and tweak it in that particular way. And I think it's a very productive conversation, but, um, yeah, it does mean that, you know, this took longer than we thought, um, and I think that, yeah, 
fair, it probably is just time. So the question is that we start off with hard statistical evidence of what we wanted to show rather than kind of having the story and then trying to get the data to, to fit the story. Um, yes, I think that's, that's, that's true. I mean, I think one of the things that I'm acutely aware of, you know, being an academic uh, at, uh, at UCL, is that, you know, I have got a bit of a reputation to maintain in terms of my academic integrity and things like that. You know, my, many of my colleagues would be delighted if I screwed up and uh, went out. Um, so I would be very, my kind of rule really is if I end up on the Today program and I'm getting interrogated on the decisions we took with the data to show what we were showing, I'd be more than comfortable in defending those particular decisions. That's my kind of question. You might not agree with them necessarily, but I'm, I'm comfortable at that. That's my level. Yep, there we go. Yeah, yep. Thanks, James. Uh, I, I, we could probably have a conversation with James for the next two hours, but um, you're hanging around, right? No, I, I am, yeah. Okay, so we can chat with James in a minute. Uh, so while Alice sets up, if you would like to grab yourself another drink or get a little bit more comfortable or, or whatever, and then we'll, we'll come back in about two or three minutes. by Alice's slides. I, I'm not even going to try, so I'm going to hand it straight over to Alice who can introduce this. Uh, Alice, thank you. Ahoy there everybody. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Ahoy. Ahoy. It's Captain Alice here, and I thought I'd start with a joke. Why not? It makes nice. Uh, do you know what the pirate's favourite letter is? Arr. Oh, you think it'd be the R? Oh no, it'd be the C. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Not well, the kids like it anyway. Anyway, I'm Captain Alice, and I'm going to tell you about the adventures of Captain Alice and the Map Lady, because that's normally what I'm called, either either or. And getting lost teaches you how to read a map, or how to use your phone, maybe. <laughs> so it all started for me in 1981. If anyone ever remembers this image from the National Geographic, you're probably as about as old as me, which is good. If you don't remember it, then this is the explosion of Mount St. Helens. Okay, it's a humongous explosion, and it destroyed a lot of um, the the area around the the surrounding areas. The trees were flattened; they were stripped bare. They looked like matchsticks. Someone had just thrown matchsticks all around. And as a five-year-old, when I saw this at my great aunt's house, it was fantastic. It was so exciting. And as a five-year-old, that's what you've got to, you've got to get them excited. So I thought, oh, this is, this is good. Volcanoes. Oh, they're good. Oh, I remember that. I went on to study um, geology, funny enough, luckily. But before that, I got my A-level results, and they were pretty pants. They were C, an N, and a D. But uh, Royal Holloway said to me, they, you can go, you can get in. One, this is a women's college, so we will accept you, but you have to do something for it. So it's nothing ever for free. So I was accepted onto um, a PhD, uh, doing a PhD, Hamish McIntyre at Imperial College 
all about um, a project out in Mexico. So I came down to London and it was so exciting. They, they, at the interview, they said, oh, we'd like you to, we'd like you to be our field assistant. It'd be fantastic. Uh, there's scorpions, spiders. You've got to buy all the beer for 30 people. You've got to cook. You've got to make fajitas every night for six weeks. So yeah, I was like, okay, that's fine. I've got two big brothers, so there's still bullying going on. That's fine. And um, yeah, beer. I can. I can't drive though. Oh, don't worry. You, you can learn to drive in the bush. That's fine. It's not, not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and this is what I helped out on. It was the uh, Chicksal of Impact Creative Project, 1996. There was a drilling program in the 60s trying to find oil out there and it was absolutely brilliant. It was the best experience of my life. I flew to Houston, then to Merida, which is north of Yucatan. And it was absolutely brilliant. Going out, getting, getting information, getting the, building up the um, little Reftech houses, planting the geophones, all the stuff, adventure, learning to drive in the jungle, having the field, if anyone's a geologist here, is, it, is anyone did geology or field work or anything? Who's a woman who needs a toilet? So I float. Us girls have to go and find trees and stuff and get thrown stones in the head by monkeys. It's embarrassing, really. <laughs> oh, God. But I saw these beautiful flowers. So I was quite interested in flowers. My great aunt was a great um, naturalist. She likes, she helped me with my gardening. Uh, she, she taught me about lots of flowers all around the world. She was a big traveller. And she said, yeah, I'll try, try and find these birds of paradise flies. So if you ever uh, buy your wife, girlfriend, husband flowers, buy some of these. They have got some air miles on them though because we can't grow them in this country. Another volcano. I went to this volcano on a horse. Now, this volcano grew up from a cornfield in 1962. The only reason I know about that because I did a little project when I was about 14. It's called Paracutin. It's the most amazing volcano. Uh, this is the church. This is over 12 miles away from the summit. Okay? And this is the lava flow. So it's, it, I think the, uh, the farmer got a little bit peed off that it couldn't grow his corn anymore because about three weeks later it was like the size of this building. So his, his cornfield had disappeared and there was the volcano. Anyway, it was very nice and I, I, I got there by horse. It was great fun. I left the horse at the post office, as you do. <laughs> so that was it. I travelled around on my own. It was great fun. I wouldn't recommend it. Anyone got teenage daughters now going off for the gap year, please don't send them to Mexico. Or you can send them with their friends, but don't let them go on their own to Chiapas and to Tuxla Gutierrez, which is one of the most dangerous places in the world. But I didn't tell my mum that. I said I was in Cancun or something, I don't know. <laughs> I went to Piccadilly. Has anyone ever been to the Geological Society in Piccadilly? If you like maps, this map here is behind a curtain. Okay, you, just, you can walk in, it says you can see it. You have to go and ask for it to be displayed because it's, it's old. And it's beautiful, and it's the geological map of England. Simon Winchester wrote a book about it, and it's a, it's a great book. I had great fun at Royal Holloway doing my uh, geology degree. Lots and lots of rocks, lots and lots of beer, rocks, field trips, um, maps. Can't really remember much else. But here's the map that I produced. Um, it's six weeks in Spain, so this time of about 15, 25 years ago, or whenever it was, years ago, I was there. Uh, I was on a PhD, um, he, this chap, George Warlock, he asked us, me and two friends, to come and map uh, 30 square kilometres okay, in southern eastern Spain. It hadn't been mapped since the 1960s when the Russians had done it, so the contour lines look like a bowl of spaghetti. So that was really, really helpful when you're up a mountain at the top there. So the top is the really tall mountains and then you've got some uh, limestone reefs, which are these things here. And there's a submarine volcano, which is this thing. And anyone know what garnet is? You can find garnets here and 
I like collecting things. I'm a girl and it's spot, spot, spot. And this was in my air, this was my field area. Brilliant. But they're useless. They're, they're actually made for sandpaper. So I kind of got them back to the jewelers now. <laughs> Those back of gems. Like, that's good. You can grind them up and make some sandpaper. I got one out of that massive, massive bag. I got one, two, and I put set one in a stove. Oh, hello, Does anyone know who this bloke is? In what film? I'm in that film. I am in that film. I promise you. I'm on a field trip, and we're driving across one of the one of the scenes where they're driving down this valley and uh, we're up inside the side of a mountain, tapping rocks, and I'm not joking, you can actually just do a still, and I'm there. And that was what, in 1999, and I'm still waiting for the check. <laughs> they tell, I'm not joking, it's amazing. I said, great, I love it. Anyway, that's the only part I play in that film. Um, I graduated from Royal Holloway, I couldn't get a job, so I went on to cartography at Oxford Brooks. Great fun, loved it. I did get a job, I got a job at Transport for London, or the TFR, the kind of equivalent FWT. Um, and spent some time there, learned about how to cut bus route maps, bus stop maps, if anyone's ever taken a bus in London, we are in London. Uh, look at the bus panels, I cut 300 of those. I don't think she's here today, but thanks for raising me. It's a good experience, you know, you've got to, if you're taking on students, give them those jobs, yeah, they've got to learn, because then, 20 years later, they can start telling you about it. Thanks. <laughs> Had a really big indent in my finger, really hurt. I was then, I went on to a place called Map Marketing. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Map Marketing. If you ever want a puzzle of where you live, so it's like a sense of puzzle of where you live, go there. You know, they'll, they'll sell you it for about 50 quid or something. Um, but I was also doing fried chicken shop mapping. <laughs> Apparently, I was called. Kentucky Fried Alice, I don't know what they call me, but th these guys wanted maps. Yeah, they wanted site centred maps with the delivery areas on. That was nearly tw 15, 20 years ago, so I might be um, responsible for quite a lot of fat people in West London. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, I did eventually join the oil industry and I was sent to Mozambique for uh, on and off for four years. Not because I've been naughty, but because they wanted me to teach the government there. There was a lot of um, oil and gas. There's a lot of gas out in Mozambique. Um, and they wanted a way to help them mapping. So I set up some mapping styles and bits and bobs for them. This is our classroom. And I did a lot of um, field work and it was fantastic. And it actually changed my whole outlook on life. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever experienced this type of Africa before, but it really does. There's no, not much electricity. This is the second floor. This is the government building in um, Maputo. The next floor up is vacant, and there's the roof. And the roof would just have holes in it. And you've heard about Mozambique on the news recently. It rains. And I tell you, it rains, it rains. And we had, you can't see it, but that's why the plug's just there and not on the floor because it just water just comes up and destroys it. There were some geoseismic tape, uh, tape libraries next door which, which were okay for me. And very lucky to go to the Kruger Park four times because it's like from here to, I know, Stevenage. It's not far at all, 20, 20 miles. So why not, mate? I've got nothing else to do in downtown Maputo. Lots of cool field work, right? absolutely amazing beautiful. I hate flying. I seriously hate flying because of these trips. I, I took at least 16 flights on one trip and a lot of the flights were held together by blue tack. Well, they don't have blue tack there, so I think it's chewing them, but it, oh god, I hate it. Anyway, we, we had a government person on one of my planes, and one of my planes, one of the planes, and one minute we're sort of just coming into land, the next minute we're not Joking, we're doing handbrake turns, and we had to like literally. My my boss was kind of there, and I was like, "I oh, surely the plane shouldn't actually be doing this banking this much," but it was banking that much anyway. So the outcome is that you know they had successful uh, license rounds, and they gained um, they gained that um, they gained lots of uh, interest in the area. 
After that, I thought, oh, I can do this myself. I've been doing this for eight years, I, I know everything. Oh, yeah, I know everything. As you do. And in April 2008, I started Silver 7 Mapping, which is my company. And the first uh, contract I got was a six month contract, and it was with the Crown Estate on Regent Street. And uh, this is Tad Oscar, he, is, he was their um, cartographer. He'd been there for about 25 years and they hand wash their maps, or they did them. And for me to see this was amazing. I saw King Henry VIII's maps, the estate maps of the Crown. Um, they kept them there only up until recently um, for, because, because it, was, it was being rebuilt just after England won the Rugby World Cup. Yes, well done. Um, they they just moved into that, that premises there. We were um, lucky enough to start off a digitisation project with them because, believe it or not, none of their maps were digital. So they had all these like map libraries and stuff and it's on Regent Street. And anyway, we were sort of saying, you must put them digitally. So um, it started, so that was really good. I was a member of the British Cartographic Society's Dress to Serve programme, which teaches GCSE level um, geography students about map skills. So it's part of your GCSE nowadays. They're doing them, actually, they did one yesterday. But if you've got kids doing the GCSEs, the geography was yesterday, GCSE. Uh, map skills uh, is one of them. So I took this round the country. It's really good fun. People, uh, BCS. Uh, members can volunteer to help uh, on it and it's really really good fun so I did notice a big decline in the skills however throughout the years that I was doing it so um, and at that time I was in London uh, working for an oil company and this is one of the Piccadilly line maps the first were like it's quite an old map and then this is the modern day version and this was this was taken on the last day that I left London, um, on my last day at uh, that company. The reason why I am Captain Alice is this little chap here. He's my son. He's in the Arctic here. We took him up to uh, Finland and uh, he's on top of a trip pillar here. Because if you haven't got one of these pictures of your children, you really have to get one, or of yourself. I've got one of myself up there. That was a little bit of a Herculean moment. Uh, this is on top of uh, uh, the mountain in the Isle of Man, because that's where my in-laws live. <coughs> no jokes. I started Mini Map Makers two years ago because Anthony asked me, Mummy, can you come and teach my friends about maps? He was four at the time. So I thought, oh, I can do that. I can teach GCSE level. I can definitely teach teach four-year-olds. That's not difficult, is it? Oh, my God. <laughs> so I was invited to come and teach um, three classes of 30, 94-year-olds. I've got one child. I just got home from him. 45 minutes, 45 minutes, 45 minutes without break. I had one flask of tea. That went in the first five minutes. I didn't get replenished. And I sat in my car afterwards and I thought my eyes were going to pop out of my head. I thought, oh, I can do this. I don't think I woke up for about three days. It was so exciting and so inspiring, and it was very tiring. Tiring, not because of the energy of the children, tiring because the communication levels for that, you have to, you have to just strip back everything to communicate with a four-year-old about maps. So I subsequently created a whole load of resources. I sell them in my friend's shops in Bedford and online. Uh, I, am, I have the adventures of Captain Alice. I have a very full, uh, full mind and quite, quite wacky ideas. But that's all because the kids like them. And they, this is Anthony's classmates and they always, even today, He's in year two and he, they always come up to me, oh, let's, oh, Captain Alice, can you come and do this with us? Can you come and... Can you make that idea? Can you make those puzzles? Can you do Yes, for sure I can. I take um, workshops at the local forest centre, Forest of Marsden Vale, um, and 
I've taught, in two years, I've taught 3,000 children and about 1,500 adults. I work with artists, as uh, Jane Tomlinson, she's an uh, artist out in Eatham. She paints maps and she painted this for me so I can use it for my marketing purposes. I'm not just a children's entertainer or an educator, I also make proper maps for proper people. And uh, this chap here, Jordan Wiley, I don't know if anyone's ever seen Channel 4 Hunted. That's who was one of the hunters and he's an ex-King's Hazar and he's a bit crazy. He did three marathons in Somalia and Afghanistan and various places. And I tweeted, I tweeted him the other day and said, I hope you've got some maps in your book. Because that's uh, quite cool places. Like, who, who runs around there? You know, I, I can't just go, oh, I'm going to go to, you know, Cabral and go and do a marathon. Um, so, where, where, where did you run? Um, he said, oh, come and meet me at the Union Jack Club and um, I'll tell you about it. Oh, all right then. So I did, and in November, those maps will be out there. So that's really cool. Was really, that was from a tweet, okay? That was from a communication. Me getting a bit arty going, I hope you've got bloody, bloody maps in there. <laughs> because actually, a lot of the adventures I hear about in the Royal Geographic Society and all the rest of it, a lot of those people don't have but, um, maps in their books. Okay, they're all adventurers and something like that. Anyway, there we are, it's fine. Um, I also, this, this year, won uh, the Bedfordshire Business Women um, Award for Best New Business for Mini Map Makers. So that's quite happy. I was, I was quite chuffed with that. Um, we are exposed to maps from zero years old to the time we die. I saw this recently in a, um, if anyone's having a baby or knows anyone having a baby, well, look, you can get that, look at this, there's a world map on a little t-shirt, I think it's really cute. I'm not having any more children, so I've got to get like older, older things like, oh, whiskey and things like that. <laughs> not for the child, but uh, We were in Land Rover the other day, I thought I'd get an F-type, um, but, uh, not an F-type, an F-pace, that's a different car, isn't it? Um, an F-pace, but no, it didn't happen, but I took a picture of the t-shirt instead. And there's the trick pillar that I think people might know about, it's in a field in Northamptonshire. So I really need um, help with you guys. I, I, I go around the country. Uh, if you know, uh, if you need corporate social responsibility um, opportunities, I've got I've got some on my website. Um, getting the message out, back skills is really it's really exciting. I do all the work pretty much, and I just ask for a bit of money, and you can come and join me. So that's quite fun. So a map ignites curiosity, wonder, excitement, and they want to explore the maps. So you have, yes, I'm just about to say, just about to say that. I've just been at, um, today, I was at Geo Business. I'm, I'm a Get Kids Into Survey ambassador. Get Kids Into Survey is quite a good uh, new thing. They're kind of copying me, but I don't tell them that, you know. Survey, it's not really maps, is it? It's fine. No, they're my friends, it's fine. And I'm Captain Allison here, okay? So if you guys um, know, you want to get some posters into your kids' schools and that, they are available on the Get Kids in the Survey website as well. And I hope you all, um, map makers, have brought your pencil cases with you today. Anyone got a pencil case with them? Or am I the only sad person here? <laughs> with my colouring pens. Because my big brothers say that I colour in and rock to mash for a job, so that's it. Thank you, thank you very much, Alice. Um, so my daughter says, oh, maps, Dad, won't you shut up about it? So, <laughs> that's impressive. I, I don't know how to Okay, uh, anybody got any questions for Alice? It was so comprehensive, <laughs> there's absolutely no questions whatsoever. They just want another beer, don't they? Alice, thank you very much. Thank you.
Um, Alice, you're staying around? Yes. So Alice is here if you want to have a chat with her afterwards. Uh, let's take a, another couple of minutes while our third speaker sets up, who, who will be Ed, um, and then we'll be back in a minute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I know the allure of having a conversation with the person next to you is far much better than listening to Ed. But, <laughs> Ed has graced us with his company and uh, I, I would like to listen to him at the very least. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ed. Ed. Hey. Ken, thank you very much. At least I haven't had to travel as far for the abuse as you've travelled, but I appreciate that. Um, I want to try to be a little bit controversial uh, this evening, just so it will keep the evening going along and uh, have a bit more conversation perhaps. So, you may or may not agree with the points I make this evening, and actually I may or may not agree with the points I make this evening, but nevertheless, it should provide some entertainment. Um, with that in mind, it would be very helpful for me if we all recognise the fact that my presentation in no way represents the views <laughs> or the opinions of my employer. And if we can all click, I agree, and I will then continue with the rest of my presentation. Everybody okay with that? Yeah, it's not that you have a choice, but if you're okay with that, I will carry on. Okay, so, the theme then, maps, geospatial, communication, all the things that we're really interested in, all the things that are really um, keen to, to us. You know, we love this. And we all hope for the best in, in what we do. And to be honest, we've probably all struggled at times when you know, we try to explain what we do. And every summer, you know, a, a report comes out in newspapers that say, oh, you know, it's all terrible. You never see a report like this on the Daily Mail that says, this is the golden age of maps. It's fantastic. We have never in our history had more access to maps than we do today. And, and this is true. You are not going to read it on the Daily Mail, clearly. But it is the reality. Today, maps are more widely used by more people around the world than at any point in our history, ever. There's no question about that. And that's largely because we consume maps now in all sorts of different ways. You know, we might be out hiking, the traditional use of maps. This is the uh, Ordnance Surveys app on their uh, mobile devices, and you can you know, wander around to your heart's content, still trying to understand what those squiggly lines mean. How many people did uh, geography, GCSE O level? Okay, so this is an unusual audience. <laughs> because at least at one point in time, you knew what those squiggly lines mean. How many people could navigate just using an Ordnance Survey 1 to 25,000 scale map and a silver compass. Liars. <laughs> <laughs> I got my map reading. If you had this app in your pocket, you'd be using it, wouldn't you? Because it's accessible, it's easy, you don't have to, oh no, I didn't buy that copy in WH Smiths, and you've got that little blue dot that shows you where you are. Probably more often though, you're going to be using your uh, maps when you're out shopping or you're going to be using it for public transport information or you're going to be using it as part of your day-to-day -day life. And that's really where the big impact has become. And these uh, maps that aren't really maps in the traditional sense, I would argue, they're very dynamic, they're based on real-time feeds, they're very focused on specific activities that we might be doing. So you can say, well, actually, Ed, it's just a thematic map. Maybe, maybe we could argue that, but they become an interface into other activities that we're doing as part of our day-to-day -day lives. We, we use them as that front end to booking a restaurant or using public transport or doing another activity. Perhaps where the biggest growth has been in that maps have become embedded into other applications. So here's the live room if you want to you know, order any sort of food. I think probably even near Brewdog will deliver by a delivery now, and you can get your beer and your pizza delivered, which is great. But the most exciting thing is you can see your rider coming and approaching your house, and you get that nice sense of, oh, this is cool, it's almost here, I love this. Maps are embedded in your application. So, it's a wonderful world. We are probably living um, in an age that I would say today, though, is peak map. 
We're not going to get any better than this in terms of the usage of maps. From now on, it's downhill. <laughs> there are going to be less maps. Yay. Uh, okay. All right. Because the map of the future, the map that potentially we're all be going to be using in the next few years, is actually not a map. And let me explain what I mean by this quite provocative statement. And the reason I make it maybe it's quite a provocative statement is that perhaps we overuse the traditional cartographic map. And we use it, but we're not really using it for its main purpose. The traditional cartographic map, I would argue, is wonderful because it gives us a synoptic view. It allows us to stand back and view human activity, or the environment, or whatever we're interested in, at a distance, and to see the spatial distribution of whatever that activity might be. So it's really good, not at the personal scale that we are increasingly interested in, but it's very good at the national, international, seeing the whole picture. Because in reality, most of us are not Winston Churchill. We are not. No, most of us are not. I just had to check. Most of us are not Winston Churchill. We're not involved in organizing and planning a world war. Winston Churchill spent most of his time in the cabinet war rooms in his map room. And he had maps of all the major theaters. And he was on a day by day basis mapping the deployment of troops and where the allies were and where the Axis powers were. And he was heavily into this. This was his thing. And that's where the map was incredibly powerful and useful because it gave him that overall view. But for most of us, are we really interested in that? Do we have strategic ambition in the same way that Churchill had potentially, you could argue, forced upon him? I would argue that's not the case. The map of the future, as I say, is not a map. Not in the traditional sense, because it's much more focused on us. The scale will have to be much more human. We're not interested in actually the contents of what might be on a 1 to 50,000 scale map, or even a, you know, a 1 to 10,000 scale map. I'm really probably only interested in things that I can see at any particular point in time. That's the scope of my interest. That's the scope of the things that I need to worry about, perhaps in the next 10 or 15 minutes. So the map of the future shrinks down to be a much smaller worldview, and may be represented in very different ways. And it's that change in scale that I think is really important for us to, to think about. And that scale may shrink down even more in the future, where we are living with this idea of of the Internet of Things. A hint to where we might be going is, is things like this. This is the uh, interface you might have in your car if you plugged your iPhone in. And the map is kind of there for giving you your directions. But if you think about it, it's actually covering a very small area of the world. Where you are and the next intersection that you need to worry about. But actually quite a lot of the screen are actual practical instructions that you need to follow. That global view of where you are in the world has become less important. Now, you could argue, well, there are big issues with doing that. How do you get your sense of orientation? How do you get your sense of where you are in the rest of the world? But actually, in terms of I want to navigate, that area is all I'm really interested in. And it may shrink even further. As I said, there's a, an age of, of ambient location today. It means that all of the time, we know where we are. We carry these devices around with us that use all sorts of different technologies to identify their, their location so they can position themselves very precisely in space. But also, we have a very comprehensive database now at our fingertips of everything else that's going on. And the future maps, the future products and services will be based around that interaction between my precise location and what's going on around me in that very near environment. Let me give you an example of that, which is pub related, like this. 
This is my own local pub in, in Teddington, the Teddington Arms. Gary, you like it? Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> it's okay. It's got this like weird ceiling thing. Where they put some kind of silver tiles, a bit like this, but these have been resprayed recently in silver. Um, and it's okay most of the time. You know, it's one of those gastro pubs where all your food is served to you on a on a slate or a piece of wood as opposed to a plate, and your chips come in a bucket. Yeah, that's cool, isn't it? And it's mostly fine. Most of the time, it's okay. But certain days in the week, there's a sporting event on, and a big screen comes down, and they put on Sky Sports or whatever, and most of the time, it's not a sport I'm particularly interested in. But I'm not that aware of sport. I don't really know when the big football game's on or what's likely to be there. So how do I know when to go into the pub? Aha, we can help you there. Every device that we carry in our pockets has the potential to share our location. And if we choose to click the box and say, yep, I'm happy to share my location, I can anonymously share my location with Google or Apple or whoever we choose, that allows us to provide additional services. So if I scroll up, it will show me a little graph that says, okay, at this point in time, live, this bar is less busy than it is usually at this particular point in time, or more busy than it is at this particular point in time. Now, is that a map? It's about geospatial information, it's about location, it's about how people are interacting with our space, but it's being displayed as a bar chart of time. Location has already been decided because I've identified a particular destination. This is an example of this idea of, of ambient location, of me or other individuals interacting with the world around them in real time, and that interaction being reflected to different products and services. And I want to finish off, because I'm already running out of time, with a real world problem. Uh, I was traveling in the Far East recently, came out of Central Station in uh, Hong Kong, and I had to get to uh, an office to go to a meeting. And I did the standard dance that everyone does when they leave a subway station, which is you come out of the subway station, you pull up your phone with your maps application, and with huge confidence, you go walking off in this direction. <laughs> and then you go, no, no, maybe not. And you go walking off in this direction. You then hope that no one noticed that you just did that, because then you turn around and go back in the direction you were originally going again. Has this happened to you? Yes. 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 Right. So how do you solve that? Well, we know why it's happening, yeah? Because we are professionals and we understand the technology. We know that when we come out of the tube station, our GNSS location isn't particularly fresh, so our phone is desperately trying to pick up some GNS signals to work out where it is. And even then when it does that, because we've been riding on an electric railway that can generates huge magnetic fields, the magnetic compass in our phone is all screwed up, so it's got no idea which direction we're pointing. How do you solve it? The way you solve it is you build a global database of buildings and images of those buildings. You then hold up your phone for a few moments and your phone recognises the buildings that you're looking at, can then orientate it more precisely and then start to give you step-by-step -step directions as you move along. And these directions are very, very localised. They're only providing you with literally the next turn. And highlighting that turn, pasted on to the building that says turn left, turn right, keep going off in the same direction. Very localised, very much just what you want to see. In this case, tied very much to the visual environment around you. And no, you don't have to walk along looking at your phone like this all the time. Once you're going in the right direction, you can put your phone in your pocket and it will then buzz next time you need to change direction and it needs to reorientate itself within those urban canyons. But that isn't the big challenge. The big challenge I want to leave you with, and something to think about, is how do you provide spatial information and directions using this as your user interface? Because I think there's a huge future in this as your user interface. Because it's something, actually, if we think about it, most of us wear all the time, particularly if we're commuting. You know, we're listening to a podcast, we might be watching a video on our mobile phone, 
This is not in any way as intrusive as walking along with a phone in front of you. It's a much more natural environment to provide directions or provide information about what's around us. And there are big challenges to understand well, how do we do that in an efficient way? How do we do that that's cognitively rich? And this very focused, again, to reinforce that point at that individual scale, which I think is the future of mapping. Thank you very much. Google Ear Map. I will pick up my royalty check immediately. Thanks, Ed, for giving us an insight into Apple's latest technology. Um, Ed, any questions for Ed? Paul Hardy here. Uh, in, in 2001, I was working for a company called LaserScan in England that was bought in a, a hostile takeover. But the, the company that bought it was very into personal <laughs> mapping, the young company. And, and they set up some of the very early personal navigation systems and in-car navigation systems. And that was the days before there was enough compute power in the car to display a map. So the technology was a mobile phone, a GPS, that sent current car position via SMS messages back to a central computer. And the central computer phoned you, <laughs> literally phoned you, and said, you know, turn at the next junction, turn left. And at that point it cut off because it didn't, it didn't want to keep paying for the, for the phone costs. And sometime later it would perk up and say, you appear to have left your route. Please turn round when it is safe to do so. Anyway, um, it, it did. I mean, I had one of those installed in my car as a big tow system, and it was actually very useful uh, because you didn't need to keep looking down at a map and following visual clues. And it was out of the way most of the time because of the sheer costs of, of providing nudges all the time wasn't, wasn't available. So. Um, it might be worth looking back at, at, at some of the technology and techniques that we used at that time. That's a very good point. You know, there's, there's seldom very new in the world. A lot of the ideas behind this kind of audio interface actually came back from a, a PhD project I was helping to supervise at Edinburgh University many, many moons ago that involved a backpack that had a laptop in it and a GPS and a headset. Uh, and it was always um, nicknamed the, the talking donkey navigation scheme. Because if you remember Shrek, the movie, it has a donkey in it that just spends all of its time talking. And this was the same idea, it's an interface that's continually talking to you. But yeah, it's, it's seldom new in the world, and this may not work particularly well either, but we're moving forward. Any more? Um, if, please tell me, if Gary phones you and says, do you fancy a pint, you don't go to an app and say, is it more or less busy than it normally is? <laughs> <laughs> is it more or less Gary than he normally is? Yeah, I am working on an app that just tells me where Gary is. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, Gary seldom calls me and, and invites me for a beer, but we do need to do it more often. Um, but, yeah. I love Gary, my friend. <laughs> Oh yeah, I think what the, um, there was a, uh, a keynote speech which I thought was really good in um, Google Maps is that I'm using augmented reality to get over that issue of repositioning yourself when you come out of the tube station, <laughs> which happens to all of us, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> um, okay. I mean, yeah, yeah. But I love the idea of having uh, augmented reality so you're holding up your phone and then it points you in directions. Because you have got your map. Absolutely. It's still early days. We're working on it. We'll get there. Battery is the issue at the moment. Uh, as a geek who's read about the cognition of maps, there's root knowledge and there's survey knowledge. What you're talking about with the audio is root knowledge. 
language. So it's not really a map, it's just a set of instructions taken through. Everyone. Well, okay, arguable. Arguable. But everyone in this room probably has a very good idea and can put on a map where they are, where Euston Station is, where some of the key points are. Because they, I think most of you will have survey knowledge because you work in this in this area, and, and that's part of our profession is to do that. But there's a there's a, a key difference between you will learn route knowledge first and then you will learn survey knowledge afterwards. So it, it, it's really to say there is a place for a map, but you're shoving it into that survey knowledge space. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. There are those those two models, but I would argue that. As you can get some of that survey knowledge and, and that knowledge of your environments around you just by having that description. So I don't say the normal words, but imagine I said, okay, the name of a large search company, because otherwise loads of people's phones will go off. If I say that and ask about what's happening, it will tell me the local weather forecast, it will tell me about my local commuter information because it's got that personalized view of me. So it gives me some sense of that that survey knowledge, but it's very much um, a personalized survey knowledge that's you know, focused on me as an individual. But, but absolutely there are cases where you do need that synoptic survey view. But I think actually for most people and for most use cases, we're much more interested in that human scale, egocentric worldview where I am the center of my map and I'm only interested in, in pretty much what I can see at any particular point in time. I agree that's useful if I'm trying to get from Euston Station to here. But next week I need to get to, to a, a, a holiday house in Mallandale. And I've got to drive from here to Mallandale. And I'll probably use the in-car navigation system to do it. But that, that, that won't, if, if I was using your system, it wouldn't tell me anything about things I might do by chance on the way there. And we'd miss out on certain opportunities. Yep, yep, can't deny that. Are you not allowed to have a friend to make rides? Oh, I didn't know that. Good, yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. Yeah. you learn something every day. Good, Good, Good Okay, I think we're done. Thank yeah. you, Ken. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Ken. Okay, uh, a couple of minutes, and then we'll have our final speaker of the evening. Um, well, it's my absolute privilege. So, I've learned something this evening. It turns out that a longitude talk is precisely one can of beer. For me, at least. Yeah, okay. um, anyway, it's my absolute privilege to um, introduce this next chap who I have to work with because I'm paid to work with him. Technically. Technically. And, um, we met over a hexagon, didn't we? We, we fought over we, a hexagon. We fought over a hexagon. I made a map once, a few years ago, um, <laughs> with some hexagons on it, and I got this email from this guy, and he said, hey, what are you doing? You asshole. Uh, I'm making a map with hexagons using that data. So what are you doing? I said, well, dude, I'm making a map of hexagons with this data, and I'm going to send you a picture of a screen grab of my file explorer with all my timestamps to show you that I am not copying you. He did, he did that. And I sent it to John and he said, fair enough. <laughs> and then about a year ago he emailed me saying, any jobs at Esri? <laughs> that's true! A year later. Anyway, that, that's the whole the story. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to welcome uh, John, my colleague, uh, who's, I don't know what you're going to talk about. Anyway, John. Nor do I. Thank you. Hey. How am I in the back? Right? I do okay projecting, especially when it's right into a microphone in front of my face. So, uh, before we get started, when I threw this sweater into my backpack in the United States, I had no idea that everybody would start calling it a cricket jumper. <laughs> Shoot. That's what it is. Shoot. And I even went to a cricket match. Somebody snapped a picture of me and put it on Twitter and it was like, oh, he's dressed for it. <laughs> Cricket jumper? I mean, to me, that's like a subspecies of some critter. Anyways. Oh, 
Yeah, I just got called a yank. All right. So uh, to shift gears, I'd really like to talk about something serious today, okay? And we're all here to learn about the dualistic pedagogies of environmental determinism and geography and anthropology. I'm waiting on that beer. It's going to really lubricate this. Uh, so are we all ready to kind of take it down a notch and get scientific? Okay. You guys ready? Oh, never mind. I don't know anything about pedagogies or environmental determinism. You saved me to the last, so I'm like three and a half pints in. <laughs> Pretty soon I'm going to be four and a half pints in. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> the world is once more as it should be. All right, cheers. Before I get going, cheers. Cheers. To longitude. Ken told me there's a hard G in that word, longitude. And I was always under the assumption that it was longitude. <laughs> longitude. I sound way better when I say it that way. All right, so I'm coming to you from Michigan, as I said, where winter has come, right? And we don't measure snow in inches or centimeters. We measure it in units of small children. Okay? And the offices in which we work are guarded by dire wolves. Here's an example from, gosh, I don't know, three weeks ago. Uh, my, my view in the morning, an hour and a half later. How do you like that, right? Just like in London. <laughs> but we're not so different, you and I, okay? So most of you are probably from the beautiful, beautiful, glorious country of England. I'm from the state of Michigan in the United States. But look at these guys, right? So when people say, oh, I live in the north of England, almost all the way to Scotland, or I live in the southeast of England, or I live in the south of I'm like, okay, I, I kind of know how far we drive that is. I've got a pretty good sense. Because they're the same damn size. I've got a great sense for how big England is. What's more, look at that chunk at the top of Michigan. So I'll give you a quick geography lesson. This is called the Upper Peninsula, because we're surrounded by lakes. This is called the Lower Peninsula. In the Upper Peninsula, we, uh, we call it the UP, and the people who live there are called Upers. Who knew that? Who said that? <laughs> is that another bloody yank back there? Boarding Flint, and you made it out! My hands are up here. <laughs> very good, very good. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, so we've got Upers, and I live in this lower peninsula area, and they call us... <laughs> Gary's out. Sorry, Gary's out of here. Uh, there's a, there's a five-mile bridge connecting these two chunks, and they call us trolls because we live under a bridge. What's more, if you take that little chunk of barely populated Michigan called the Upper Peninsula, and you paste it to the bottom, it looks and Oh, look at this. Very familiar, right? You can even transpose your location in Michigan and see where you're from in, in England. So. I grew up in a town called Mount Pleasant right there, which corresponds almost perfectly with a town called Nottingham. Yeah. <laughs> you must be Ken's father. I'm Ken's footman. Okay, so before we get too deep, uh, I'd like to talk about coordinate geometry. Coordinates, two ordinates. First of all, latitude. So latitude is a fact of nature how far up you are, how far down you are, because this earth that we're on right now is spinning around, around a pivot point, and it's a guarantee what that pivot point is. We're also rotating, re rotating, revolving? Somebody tell me. We're moving around the sun, and it takes once a year, and it's a slow thing. And it's something that's easy, easily measured. Latitude is something that was discovered by humans, right? Latitude exists in nature as a fundamental prim principle of the geometry of the sphere that we're living on, spherish looking thing that we live on. Latitude is natural and it just happens, it has to be discovered. Longitude is different. 
right? Longitude is hard. How far east and west you are on a circle is very difficult, right? You don't have that spinning that you can just say, boom, this is where it spins and this is how far south I am. Here's where the sun is every day and it moves very slowly throughout the year. I can very easily, you know, figure out my latitude. But longitude is really hard. And it took a long time to figure out longitude because they had to create very precise clocks. Actually, there was a battle between incredibly precise star charts versus incredibly precise clocks. And the clocks won, by the way, because of the English. Thank you very much. Uh, longitude is hard. So why am I saying, why am I talking about latitude and longitude? Longitude is hard because it doesn't happen on its own, right? Uh, we're here together because of the efforts of people who've done a lot of work, and a lot of planning, and a lot of inviting, and a lot of thinking, and a lot of communicating. And I want to thank the organizers of Longitude for making this happen. So Longitude is not easy. Longitude is hard. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So my first real job out of school, you know, I had my geography degree, I was a big shot, right? GIS, uh, I can click buttons and do buffers and stuff like that. My first job was wearing a gigantic $10,000 Trimble, $10,000, 20,000 or 5,000 pounds, 6,000, 8,000 pounds. Uh, back then it was, a, it, was, it was a lot fewer pounds. So I was wearing this GPS unit worth more than my life, right? And it was my job, I worked for the water department to uh, locate the water services that went from the mains to the houses. Every town in my city where I was working in the glorious town of Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And I would stand there with my headset and uh, a metal detector and this GPS unit and a pocket full of little blue flags and spray paint. And I'd go meow, meow, wee. And I'd eventually find it and I'd mark it on the curb and I'd stick a little flag in there uh, and then, at the end of the day, I'd log all, you know, maybe 300 or so GPS coordinates into their nascent GPS system, their, their new GIS. Because I was replacing something. What was I replacing? A filing cabinet. And every address in the town of Mount Pleasant had a little card with its address and the number of paces from the curb and the number of paces from a landmark, like a tree or a rock or a fence, and it would tell you where to find the water service. And uh, believe it or not, when I was GPSing all these locations, there were a lot of folks that I worked with that thought that was a tremendous waste of time and, and energy, right? Do you know why? Because they had a perfectly good system of record right here. And a lot of them didn't even need to use that system of record because they would say, it's all right here. I know where every water service is in the town of Mount Pleasant. But uh, Malcolm Fox believed in me. He believed in the mission, and every time I would come back and dump my GPS coordinates into this brand new, ever-growing GIS system, uh, he would kind of block me a little bit from those guys who were slightly threatened about the fact that there was a, a digital system replacing this perfectly good system. Uh, so, every one of us here has people who have invested in them, and shown them grace, and believed in them, given them jobs and known that they could do it, right? Uh, for me, in this very specific case, it happened to be Malcolm Fox. But everybody right here is probably thinking about a person that when you were starting out in your field, they showed you a lot of patience and a lot of grace, and they taught you things, and they invested in you. So, I'm going to ask you, an English crowd, to participate vocally on the count of three, right? Name the person that you're thinking of right now who was that for you. One, two, three. Isn't that great? Right? Everybody just shouted a name, and I think that's wonderful. It's because we've all got somebody who believed in them and supported them. So I was replacing a paper-based system of record, but you know what? Paper maps have an amazing history, rich and glorious and beautiful. This happens to be a map uh, written by, drafted by, created by, engineered by, who? Anybody, anybody know this one? An Italian, Leonardo da Vinci. He made this, and he also uh, made all kinds of inventions and, and, and improvements. Of course, this is Leonardo da Vinci. Here's another map. This map 
which is actually kind of a charming little handwritten thing, hastily done for practical purposes, was created by uh, an upstart, you know, little farmer in a colonial place. George Washington, right? An ingrate. What an ingrate, George Washington. Just kidding. He became our country's first president. But what was his first job? He was a map maker. He was a surveyor. It was his job to survey things and plot down the geographic location of stuff. And he did it on maps, right on paper. So I sampled some of those textures. Maybe you've seen me describe this before, but I'll quickly uh, plug it. I sampled these textures and made it available as a texture library for people to apply it to their own vector graphics. And somebody in the Netherlands took this, somebody named Ernst Eichelenbohm, and he, in about five minutes, made a base map of the national base map of the Netherlands, in the hand, literally in the hand of George Washington, which I think is really fun. Yeah. Uh, here's another paper map, right? I'm in England, specifically London, and Ken's been showing me around since Saturday, and I'm exhausted, but I love it. Uh, and of course we went to, on our first day, maybe it was our second day, what's this? Broad Street! The Broad Street Pump! And I pretended to be, like, be drinking out of it, even though there's no handle anymore. Uh, so he, look at this map! Just cholera, right? You know, the, the theory at the time was that, you know, this disease was spread down. Air, you know, bad air. And uh, that's how cholera was spread. And John Snow was like, yeah, I've got a pretty data-based approach to this, and I think it's something else. Uh, and he said, well, take a look at what's going on here. There's nothing happening here, right? We've got this enormous plague, and it's just wiping out the population. You've got these stacks of bodies outside the door, and he's rendering these uh, in, a, in a very interesting geographic way, so people can look at it and go, oh, yeah, holy, holy cow. You know, the Broad Street Pump maybe is pretty troublesome. But how many people died who lived above or near this brewery? Zero. This is the Lion Brewery. So, why am I showing you this? It's because it is, it's an excuse for me to say zoom and enhance, right? So I can tick that off my bucket list. Cholera couldn't survive in beer because all of the employees were given an allocation of beer. and They didn't bother with the water. And the brewery itself had a very deep well, right? Isn't that amazing? Uh, he didn't notice this because of data being there. He noticed it because data wasn't there. So if we were a practical group of folks uh, in a conference hall of a hotel or something, we'd say, well, obviously, the principle that we can learn here is the absence of data is data. There's a lot of information in that, right? There's a lot of wisdom there. But we're not, right? So the real lesson is, beer saves the day, right? Spontaneous applause from the British audience. It's the second time that's happened in my life. I'd like some of you to record that. Thank you very much. So paper maps are really cool, and I love them. But so are pixels, and that's fundamentally what I work in, is pushing and pulling pixels. I'm a pixel pusher. Somebody described design as pixel pushing, and I thought that was really, pretty great. And it's what I do a lot. Uh, old things are amazing and influential and they can be inspired by what's been done in the past and so can you. Um, but also inventing and innovating is, is a lot of fun too. Uh, what if we could blur the lines between all those things, right? What if we were working with people who weren't in the same office as us or weren't even in the same decade as us? What if we could take something that was made years before us by somebody who had no idea who we were or even that we would exist? and be influenced uh, to, to make something new and interesting. Well, let's, let's try. So, uh, a short while ago I discovered something called Shaded Relief Archive. Anyone used this? Has anyone seen this or heard of this before? A couple hands. Okay, good. Steve Chilton. Yeah, good. Uh, it's this remarkable set of uh, high-quality scans of hand-painted hill shade from cartographers of past decades. So I was surprised to learn that there was a time when hill shades were created uh, not from digitally derived digital elevation model algorithms. People actually painted these. And they just pencils and airbrushes and smudge sticks. It was insane. 
So they were using spot elevations and contour lines, and they were running it through the highly complex intelligence, deep learning, neural network system of their damn brains, and they were creating hill shades, right? And they're these artistic, beautiful things. Uh, and, and here they are, and many of them were geolocated already for me, which meant I could easily and lazily just save it and drop it into my mapping software, which I want to do, given my lazy perspective. So here is uh, something that caught my eye, because I'm from the United States, and I saw this one, and I said, okay, Erwin Schutzler, he painted this in 1965. What a beautiful hill shade. It's actually kind of hard to do hill shade right in the digital environment, and it's actually this kind of a uh, sweet little slippery slope that you can get into and, and I've often made the reference that once you start getting into hillshade and drawing hillshade and deriving hillshade from data, it's like a fish concert, right? You go there and then bang, 40 years later you wake up and you don't know what happened, right? That's hillshade. You will get sucked in, it's incredible. You could even do uh, dot stippling hillshade, right? There's no end to the cool creative tasks that you can apply this to. So here's Herwig Schutzler's beautiful heel shaded uh, cover of the United States. And this would have been photographed and combined with other, other photographic plates into, a, into a, a, a beautiful reference map of the United States where this is kind of pushed back and, and softly apparent. And I thought, gosh, that is beautiful. Because it is hard. It's hard. A lot of times digital heel shade has got too much detail. It's not necessarily showing you the appropriate scale. But an artist sees it uh, before satellites were showing him really what the actual shadows and interplay of light on mountains looked like, right? This was invented in the human mind before it was seen by humans. And so I thought, huh? I thought, let's turn on my mouse. So I saved it and I dropped it into my GIS program. So let's give this an imagery base map. And it was georeferenced. So here's Herwig's hillshade map of the United States. Uh, 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 uh. That's pretty interesting. Now by default, it's white to black. You're looking at a gray scale. The shadows are black. Light is white. Is that how it works in real life, right? How many of you are painters? How many of you have actually like mixed hues before and, and put a paintbrush to a canvas? Do you really use black and white all that much? It's almost never, right? You're using darker hues and you're playing with those hues because that's how the real world works, right? So think back, maybe you took a remote sensing course uh, at, I did and I learned that uh, the reason the sky is blue is because uh, water vapor bounces around the short wavelengths a lot more easily. So when you look up, you see those short wavelengths just getting pounded all over the place, and that's why it's blue. When you look at a sunset, and the sunset turns orange and then crimson red. And it's very uh, uh, longest angle. And the reason for that is because those long wavelengths of red are able to break through the atmosphere, the thick atmosphere that it's traveling through. So sunsets are red for that reason, the sky is blue for that reason, Let's take what we've learned and start applying this. So, I'll add an intermediate color of black and I'll make it fully transparent. All right. Back to white. Okay, black, nothing, white, right? Let's just see what it looks like. Okay, already we've got something really interesting. What's going on? How's this projecting? Projecting pretty well, actually. Really, this is a nice projector. I'll put this right here so you can see both models. So, okay. But like I said, shadows aren't perfectly black. Shadows are actually kind of like this deep blue. So let's pick. Let's pick like a deep kind of bluish purple. Make it nice and dark. We'll drag this transparent midpoint way over there, add another one and say, okay, and then it kind of migrates into like this kind of misty, washed out, desaturated blue. Okay, this is looking pretty interesting. 
Pull this in just a little bit. And white, right? Perfect light has all the color combinations and you see it as white. Really only if you're looking at the results of a light bulb and a flashlight. But in reality, you get that filtering that happens. And so the warm sunlit slopes are dealing with this direct sunlight and it's maybe a little golden amber sort of hue. That's it, okay. Oh, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Right? What am I doing? I'm just playing with stuff. And then if I drop a little cutout over the United States, you get something that's pretty interesting. It would actually be very difficult to create something that's kind of uh, artisanal like this in the digital environment. So what I just did was collaborate with Herwig Schutzler's work from 1965, who had no idea that I exist or, or would ever exist, right? I had no idea that Herwig Schutz, Schutzler sat there in his studio and airbrushed a hillshade of the United States based on spot elevations and some contour lines and uh, thinking that he just had a deadline and he had to get something that had to be photographed for production. <clears throat> but I think there's something really cool about that. What's more, we've got something that's very old, pixels uh, that are representing airbrushed work that was done in 1965, decades ago, and we're blending it with satellite imagery which is current, right? Without, with, with, without, with, right? We're merging the past and the present. I'm collaborating in the current time with somebody who's doing work in the past. And I'll tell you something. So, uh, I made this map and I shared it on my blog, which is adventuresinmapping.com. By the way, everybody just go ahead and bookmark that. I'll wait for five and a half seconds while I do <laughs> adventuresinmapping.com. Uh, and I wrote a how-to. Here's how to do it. And a little bit of how I felt about it. And then I got an email. And I was a little bit nervous. Email. Oh, great. What's this? Guess who it was from? It was from Herwig. The dude who painted that in 1965 sent me an email. He's in his 90s. He was in a rush because he was about to jump on a cruise with his wife for their anniversary. But he told me that he was pleased that a cartographer from the current day was collaborating with the work that he had done so many years ago and thought it was wonderful that the past and the present can converge. And I gave Herwig an internet high five, right? What an amazing surprise. And I think that there's something pretty beautiful about that. Uh, and it got me to thinking, um, my sec so I told you about my first job out of school. My second job out of school was with a Native American tribe on a small island uh, off the coast of the United States in the Atlantic called Martha's Vineyard, 20 miles by 10 miles, a small chunk of land. It's the first job I got uh, past my, uh, my uh, water company job. And one of the first things that I was asked to do was, again, strap on a GPS unit worth more than my life and go out and record the location of something. And the location was uh, an ancient ruined, uh, not ancient, right? I'm in England, okay? I'm from the United States, so do you know what 200 years is to me? Oh man, that's forever ago, that's ancient, right? They wanted me to, to uh, record the geographic location of their ruined previous village, which was, uh, abandoned at least 200 years ago. And it would have been houses with stone foundations and, and wood and, and shingles and windows and doors and sidewalks, which is actually pretty remarkable given the fact that I showed up to the general location with my Trimble GBS unit and thought, where the heck is this? Right? I'm looking for a ghost town, but I saw nothing. I saw a few gentle dips in the landscape. There's a dip, there's a dip, there's a dip. Oh, okay, what's going on here? And each dip was kind of surrounded by this ring of stones, which was all grown over with ivy and vines. And I realized that that was the destroyed locations of the old homes. And what I was seeing as the slight elevations around the perimeter of those depressions was the foundations. Those foundations were made of stone, right? They would have been formidable stones. 
Uh, and in those 200 years, they had tumbled down and fallen to the side and caved in to the uh, small cellars that they had dug with their uh, shovels when they built them. And I was like, wow, this is uh, absolute ruin. And then I noticed something, right? I, I, I took a step back and I saw a daffodil, right? I didn't just see one daffodil. I saw a perfect row of daffodils out in the middle of the woods, thick woods, uh, hardly any light, a perfect row of daffodils. And the daffodils surrounded each depression and there were perfect lines connecting those uh, little rectangles to a, a long gone road that would have run through that community, right? These were gardens that the original owners had planted around their homes and planted along the sidewalks that would have led to the road. And why did they do that, right? They did it to invest in their area and make something beautiful, but they used life, right? They put a bulb in the ground and that bulb just does what it does, right? It comes up every season and dies back in the winter, back to its bulb. It comes back in the spring and it dies back in the winter. 200 years later, it's doing its beautiful work just where they were planted, right? You've got a perimeter of each home and a little line lining the sidewalk. And the homes, which are made of stone and mortar and wood, were long gone. And that was all that was left. And I thought that was pretty wonderful. And I actually thought of it when Herwig had sent me that email. So, uh, before I close, I had asked you to share the name of somebody that had invested in you. So, as a pivot, I'd like to think that there's probably somebody that each of you are thinking of who you could invest in. So, you can be that person that 20, 30 years later, somebody's sitting in a pub and when they're asked by some, you know, doofus from the United States who invested in you and who believed in you, who showed you grace, they might say your name, right? So, that person, whoever is in your mind, don't say it out loud on the count of three, but think about them and picture their face, and go ahead and invest in them as you move forward. And that's all I have to say about that. Thanks for coming. Longitude, thank you, Longitude. Cheers. That was two hours. <laughs> no, like three. Thanks, John. Um, so, firstly, thank you. That was cool. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Secondly, does anybody want to ask John anything at all? <laughs> you should. You really should. Does that mean I just totally nailed it and had <laughs> answered all potential questions? John, explain, oh, there we go. Hang on, explain hang. the leg before wicket cricket rule. <laughs> leg before wicket. You get 11 guys. Nobody gets out. There's no balls. There's only ball outs. <laughs> no balls. Everybody wears shirts like they got them at the Salvation Army like I did. <laughs> You break, most importantly, for finger sandwiches and tea. Yep. That's it. That's Everybody's most, that's very polite to, to each other. Yep. And there's only two bases. There's only two bases. I have to worry about four where I'm from. It's almost twice as hard. Cricket. That's pretty much cricket. That's <laughs> more high school. Any questions for John? Oh, one right. Oh, that's convenient. Oh, Hello. Yeah. So I wrote a blog post describing the process and I mentioned his name and I linked to the source data, which everybody should always link to the source data. Any journos in here? Any journos. Anytime you do a data visualization that uses data, link back to the source data. I actually know a lot of uh, places have a policy to do that, which I think is wonderful. So anyways, I had linked to it and somebody who, uh, actually a colleague who had worked with him in the distant past had uh, forwarded it to him. Herwig saw it. I thought it was wonderful. Um, Herwig is a pretty interesting fella. He was born in uh, on the other side of the Iron Curtain, right? An Iron Curtain has descended. Herwig was born on the other side of that. He ran the wall and came to the United States 
and worked as a cartographer and then set up his own little cartography shop. And then he was kind of swallowed up by a larger cartographic company with uh, some big chops. And ultimately that cartographic company was bought by MapQuest. So Herwig was the hill shape designer for what became MapQuest. Isn't that cool? Herwig. Any more brain busters? The question is, to what extent does Ken influence my personal and, and professional life? <laughs> uh, and the answer is, oh yeah, all the time. Ken, Ken and I are pals. Uh, yeah, I, I grew up in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, kind of right in the crook of that little bay there. And I actually said, this is where I grew up. And I put a little dot on it. And I, I think I tweeted a photograph of that. And uh, Ken said, good heavens, that, that's almost exactly Nottingham. <laughs> I, I would never have said good heavens. Dear me, <laughs> why that's Nottingham. And I said, you mean Nottingham? 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 <laughs> Birmingham? Is that by Birmingham? There's actually a Birmingham in Michigan. And if you called it Birmingham, Birmingham, you'd quickly die. <laughs> the guy from Flint knows. Can we talk about Mitch? <laughs> Mitch again, yes. Actually, I was talking to an English fellow who said uh, his wife is from the United States, and anytime he uh, uses uh, the word Michigan, he pronounces it Michigan because he knows it will annoy her. <laughs> but she happened to be from Illinois. And I asked, well, do you pronounce it Illinois? And he had no answer to that. I was confused. Any more questions, John? How to pronounce Leicester Square? Not <laughs> Leicester. Or Toaster. Alright, spell toaster. You say the same. Don't do that. <laughs> spell toaster. No, this, this no, no. Spell toaster. No, no, this is cruel. You say the same. He's just American. <laughs> He's here. Alright. Thanks, John. No, yeah. <laughs>